All right. Well, good evening. Uh, I taught this lesson last night, um, and my microphone wasn't working. It was a super easy fix. All I had to do was a, uh, just push update, and it took like, I don't know, 45 seconds maybe to update install. So could have done it <laughs> last night. But uh, so I have to re-record this lesson. There were some great comments that uh, everyone made. And I wish that I had them recorded. So if I remember them, I'll say them. But uh, otherwise, it's just going to run through the lesson from last night, okay? So the, the first thing, before we get into the lesson, is, um, is you know, obviously with the restrictions, a lot of the normal, um, you know, reaching the community things kind of had to be put on a hold. Um, you know, Obviously, I mean, like one thing that we used to do is we go to the library and, and work it out where we would give out Christmas boxes and stuff. Well, with social distancing and the library being open and closed and open and closed, you know, you, you really can't do that. So, uh, just a little idea. We need to start thinking uh, it forward. Um, how can we? Um, wow, that was really loud. It's like a earthquake almost. Uh, uh, how can we continue to reach people assuming that the situation either... Jeez, that's really loud. I, assuming either the situation does it stays the same, it doesn't get any better, or assuming that it gets worse. Um, uh, it seems to me like we should stop thinking about the idea of, well, let's just hold it out. Let's just... Let's just you know, outlast it. Well, okay, what if it goes on for years? I mean, we can't just stop doing things for the community because it goes on for years. So, you know, it's something that we're going to have to start thinking real, using, you know, it's going to be a little difficult, but I think if, if we really put our heads together, I, I think that we can uh, find new ways to reach our community for this, uh, well, for this difficult time of evangelism. It's very hard to do ministry uh, right now. I mean, everything keeps closing. Uh, so, you know, a lot of closed doors, but for every closed door, we got, just got to find a new one, uh, open door, that is. <laughs> um, also, we are uh, reading through the Bible this year. I want to encourage you to read it, too, even if you have before. Um, it's surprising how many Christians uh, don't read the Bible. It's also surprising how many people have an opinion of the Bible who don't actually read it. Um, uh, we are doing a 40-day church fast. Uh, I want to encourage you to try it out. Uh, if you've never fasted before, now is as good a time as any. Um, so, last night uh, we looked at this this uh, question. We'll be looking at it for uh, two more weeks after after this lesson. Two more lessons after this lesson. Is church a waste of time? Now, obviously, uh, this year has been a trying time, and, and there's been a lot of different things that have happened. Um, and you know. Now that we're in the middle of this thing, you know, we're kind of, we've been doing it for a while. We can we can safely re-ask this question: Is church a waste of time? You know, uh, maybe some of us live in places where churches still aren't open. I don't know. Um, and without getting into the argument of you know, hey, should churches rebel against the government? And, you know, that's not what we're talking about. We're just looking at the question: Is church a waste of time? Um, so typically, people who think that the church is a waste of time have four different um, excuses. We're going to look at two of them tonight. And by no means do I mean to be exhaustive. These are just four big ones. Um, so excuse number one, it isn't relevant. Uh, it's an obligation with little or no payoff. A lot, a lot of what happened after... Um, after uh, the churches had been closed because they were, you know, deemed non-essential, was people started realizing, you know, I'm doing this, but I, I'm not really into it. I've kind of just been doing it out of habit. It doesn't really, you know, impact my life. It really has nothing to say. And then to make it worse, it seems like um, Christianity in America, at least, became kind of cultic with their following of nationalism and certain presidents and stuff. And, uh, you know, it just was hard for people to who either haven't gone to church or minimally involved in church or who you weren't Republican. You know, it, it, is this relevant to me? Is it relevant to my life? Does it have anything to teach me to learn that I can learn from? Uh, so, you know, an obligation with little or no payoff. And uh, that was really what a lot of people had a problem with. Um, and uh, so I want to just look, look at the idea of it, is this a biblical idea? And so for that, I'm going to Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 24 and then 25. Um, it says here, 
And let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, when I was a kid, all that we focused on was this part right here. Um, as some are in the habit of doing, the less spiritual, the sinners, who, you know, the, the, the bad Christians who aren't there for Sunday morning and Sunday evening and uh, Tuesday and Wednesday and Friday and Saturday, you know what I mean? And it was almost like a competition who can be here the most. And we were so busy going to the church, so we actually forgot to be the church. Um, but there's actually some really good points here. He's like, okay, let us consider one another, one another think about each other, how, how we can encourage each other, how can we, how can we move each other forward, um, and, and let's not let's not stop meeting together. So there's a few things. Um, the context of this verse is, is, is oftentimes removed, but I just want to focus about how the church in the Bible is a lot different than oftentimes the church that we go to. So here he says in Hebrews about how, excuse me, he, he, how he says it here in Hebrews about how, <clears throat> sorry, I had a, <clears throat> had a burp. <coughs> uh, so he says here in Hebrews about how it's supposed to be a place that, that is encouraging one another, that, that's meeting together, at, you know, and all this good stuff. And uh, okay, all right. But the verses before it, verses 19 through 23, it talks about how, well, I'll, I'll start reading. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart and full assurance of faith. And he keeps going, but, the, but I just want to get the main idea here. Since we can enter into the holy place... Since we can draw near to God, let's not let's not uh, let's not abandon meeting together. He even says in verse twenty three, "Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering." So the church right there is a is a means for us to encourage one another to stick with it. It's 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 obviously directed by God, and the New, New Testament church believed in it. Um, historical Christianity has always met together. Um, and since Jesus has made a way for us, as you know, obviously um, our great high priest and all this, and, and we can enter in, then that means that we should continue to move on, or I'm sorry, to meet together. And then in verse 26, it says, um, uh, For if we deliberately go on sinning after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And he goes on, to, on with this conversation, and I, I'm not trying to say that if you don't go to church, it's a sin, although it kind of seem the Bible does seem to imply that multiple times, kind of like it's God's idea. And when you don't, not necessarily that not going to church is a sin, but that it does have uh, negative consequences. For instance, they've done studies and it's shown that if you are not involved in church, your children really won't, aren't going to take your religion overly that serious. So anyways, there's a lot of different things like that, but my, my moral of the story being here, the, the verse before this whole don't don't forget, don't abandon meeting together, the verses before are talking about, well, you know, this is what Jesus has done. Therefore, we should meet together as almost like a means of obedience, as a way of, of honoring God and, and making that worth it. And, and you know, uh, since we can and ushering each other on and encouraging and all those things. And then the verses after it, he's talking about not getting involved in sin. And that tells me that he is saying that meeting, meeting together as a church is a preventative to sinning. It's something that keeps us from sinning. So the thing about church is it's supposed to be relevant. It's supposed to be very relevant. It, it oftentimes isn't, but it's supposed to be. And the Bible, for instance, it addresses real life issues, but sometimes we don't read it or you know we just kind of read certain parts and we don't really study it. Um, the church itself is – we're supposed to be encouraging each other, uh, ushering each other onward. We're, it's supposed to be a means to help us to change and to grow and to learn. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. In fact, a lot of times we go to church so that we can feel better about ourselves so that we can look down on others. And I think that there's just a big uh, disconnect there. Uh, modern Christianity has moved to this thing where it's not even about Jesus anymore. It's, it's basically just about me and my feelings. And there's a certain inner longing of, of, of the soul. Even C.S. Lewis talked about it in his philosophical works. And the church is supposed to be a means of getting that inner longing uh, resolved, for, for lack of a better word. I and mean, obviously, uh, church should be a means of, of better physical health, too. Uh, studies show that when you're involved in church, you're going to live longer, for instance. Now, unfortunately, though, uh, well, <laughs> sometimes it's it's it ages you. And makes you kind of just get tired of it all. So, uh, what what makes people believe in excuse number one? Now, now people gave great answers last night. I, I wish I could remember them. Um, not having your answer questions answered. Um, 
man, there was just a lot of good things that people said, and I, I, I wish I could remember all of them. Some of them were things that I actually uh, had on my PowerPoint, so I'll just go through my list. And if I remember any others, I will. I'll be sure to mention them. So first off, Christians don't act like Jesus. Uh, I remember a song growing up from a band called DC Talk, where, he, where at the beginning of it, the the song has this guy and he's praying and he says, "The single greatest cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge God with their lips, but then you know they go out and they just they just do their own thing." And, and there's that disconnect there. Christians not acting like Jesus, and it's hard to believe that the church is relevant when it is so connect disconnected. It, people people assume that Christianity is what the people claiming to be Christians act like. So, okay, uh, you know, they believe in conspiracy theories, they're just kind of wackadoos, they're angry, they evidently hate gays or something, uh, and, you know, it's just, that's what most people's encounter of the church is like. And, you know, obviously they're not interested in... in turning the page to see if the book gets any better. And so they're saying, hey, is church relevant to my life? And they're seeing all these different things, and then they're seeing a bunch of wackadoos in, in the news, like Kenneth Copeland and stuff, and they're just, I don't see how this relates. You know, they see Christians who are holding these flags about, you know, uh, the, the Christian flag and all this stuff while they're, you know, storming the, the Capitol building, and it's just like, you know, I, I think that maybe that's a poor image of Jesus. So Christians not acting like Jesus. Number two, Christians believe in a lot of conspiracy theories. You'd be surprised during the past year how many of them there are. Now, obviously, I know that there are some things that, you know, uh, secret things. Okay, I, I get that. You know, I, I, I got it. Uh, obviously, there are some things that 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 are that are true but hidden. I, I get that. You know, but not everything is a conspiracy theory. And uh, when there's no proof or, or, or facts of any kind to back something up, I mean, you really just got to be careful with this. Um, you know, people talking about things with politics and conspiracies and aliens and conspiracies and just, uh, it's just, uh, Christians have kind of gotten to be known as um, extremely gullible, and I'll just kind of leave it there. Church is often more about preference and tradition than God. It's often about how I want things, how I grew up having them. You know, what's what's better uh, for me? For instance, I I've I've writ, rewritten a number of of um, of hymns to make them more relevant and to kind of give them to the next car, next generation, those kinds of things. But in a way that kind of rewards them and gives the basic meaning of the song without sticking to the same format and wording, um, even to the point of many of the songs just completely rewritten and. Uh, a lot of times people have a problem with that, obviously. That's not the way I had it when growing up. But if you actually stop and think about it, it really isn't a bad thing. So we have all these hymns with all these words that we don't understand. Like, for instance, here I raise mine Ebenezer. Can you imagine you've never come to church ever before, and your first experience in a church, they've got an organ and a bunch of old people singing with their stone faces, here I raise mine Ebenezer. Is that going to mean anything to you? I mean, really anything? See, but the problem is, is we're not concerned about touching the heart of God because we don't know what these words mean. We're not concerned about joining together in unity because half the people hate the song. We're not, we're not. Now, I'm not saying you should try everything to, you know, flock around the easily offended, but there comes a point when you have to say, what are we actually accomplishing here? And you know, is it good? Matthew 15:9 9, says, "They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines human commands." Um, and, and this is something that, you know, Jesus dealt with. This isn't new, uh, and that's 2,000 years ago, but it's still going on today People where people would rather have their own preferences and their own traditions rather than God. Whoops, sorry. Um, and, and the last thing here, that actually, I guess there's two more things. Um, the next thing, <laughs> bad experiences. Um, I will say this, that most atheists that I've met um, they they don't really have a problem with with God. They they can believe in God. They, they, the whole you know, hey, if you can't see him, he's not there. They they say that in their argument, but then they'll turn around and say, well, I believe in aliens. So obviously they don't care that there's there's no physical proof for something. And then they'll say, well, that's different because with how big the universe is, it just stands for reason. Yeah, and with how big the universe is, it also stands to reason that it had to have been created by something. See what I mean? Like it's the exact same argument, but you know. So my point being this: I'm not trying to start a fight with atheists. My point, my point being this: um, 
which if I'm not trying to start a fight with atheists, I'm not doing a very good job. <laughs> um, is that a lot of times people will argue with you about something, but there, but there's actually something else that's going on. Something else is bothering them. Most atheists I've met have a problem with, with the religious people, not with God. They they can believe in a God, you know, absolutely. They can they can believe in those kinds of things. They'll argue with you about it and whatnot, but the real the real problem is with their bad experiences, usually with Christians. I think the single greatest <laughs> cause of atheism in the world today is 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 well, Christians who who don't live like Jesus. And um, well, yeah, James two, excuse me, James two three through four says. Uh, if you look with favor on one wearing the fine clothes and say, sit here in a good place, and yet you say to the poor person, stand over there or sit here or on the floor by my footstool, haven't you made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And, you know, this – he's talking about when people come into the church, you know, catering to the rich over the poor. But what, what's happened ever since I was a kid is that this has been taught where you have to wear your Sunday best to be accepted here. You have to look the part. You have to, you know, women have to look like this. They have to do this. They have to do this. Uh, this isn't allowed. Um, and we can all get together and talk about how stupid homosexuals are. What? Like that? That can't. That can't be the. Is that kind of a church a waste of time? You know, it kind of seems like it. And those bad experiences are things that you never get a second first impression. And uh, you just got to be careful with these with these preferences and traditions about hats and suits and all kinds of nonsense. Uh, and then obviously the next two things, unanswered prayers and unanswered questions. When people uh, pray for something and God doesn't answer, the whole genie mentality, which obviously um, it's usually something that's that's not a joking matter, like uh, the death of a loved one or something like that. And, and I think that part of that is from bad teaching on prayer. Prayer isn't... I'm going to ask for whatever I want, and God's going to do what I want. Eh, that, that's not prayer. Eh? We could have whole lessons on prayer. Eh, that's not really the discussion today, though. But my point being, maybe if we were more honest about what prayer is, then people wouldn't be so turned off when their um, prayers that God decides not to answer are not answered. Uh, and then the other thing, unanswered questions, where, where people have just real simple questions and well, you should just believe it because it's in the Bible. Uh, why should I believe the Bible? Well, because it's God's book. You know what I mean? And it's, I'm not saying that it's not God's word. I'm not saying that. But, I mean, there's nothing wrong with having answers. Well, much more could be said, but we're just going to go ahead and move on there. Uh, so number the excuse number two, I don't need it. I'm strong enough. I'm more spiritual than them anyways. Now, this is something that I hear quite frequently. Christians are getting into the mindset of, you know, kind of being anti-church. And I understand that there's a problem. I get that. But sometimes it's better to just be the problem. I'm sorry, be the solution yourself and to keep sticking with it. Because if everybody just gives up, there's going to be nothing but but hypocrites in the church. I mean, it, you, you got to be the person to show a little bit of light. Philippians 2, 3-4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. And this verse is completely in contradiction to that second excuse because it's not about you. It's not about my personal preferences, what I want, what feels better for me. It, it's it's not. It's it's about God. It's It's about others. You know, absolutely. Galatians 6.1, for instance, says, brothers, brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit. And this is the part I want to pay attention to right here. Watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. And the idea here being, okay, watching out for yourselves. What we like to do is we like to lord it over other people. And the whole idea of this verse is, you know, you could fall into the same sin just like them. In fact, Proverbs uh, chapter – hold on, let me let me find it here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 16, starting in verse 18, says this. Pride comes before destruction and an arrogant spirit before fall. So there's a few things here that we can look at. And let me, let me come back to this. I just want to come back to this and say, you know, all of these things that what makes people believe in excuse number one, they could be resolved. Christians don't act like Jesus. Well, maybe we should start, you know, practicing what we preach and being genuine instead of putting on a front all the time. 
Uh, Christians believe conspiracy theories. Maybe, maybe spend a little bit less time worrying about whether you know a certain uh, president is a mutant alien half breed, and instead start focusing on whether or not um, you are loving the least of these. Maybe that would be a better option. Um, church is often about preferences. Give it up. Start start challenging yourself to give up the way you've always done it and the way you want it for what honors God and reaches people. Bad experiences. Everybody's going to have a bad experience. You can't remove bad experiences that are part of life, but you can be genuine with people. Uh, unanswered prayers. You can't really do anything for that, for that but you can reach people. You can uh, touch people. You can... Um, you know, when you see somebody struggling, you can you can be you can give an ear and not instantly have all the answers. All the answers. But with that being said, unanswered questions. Do a little bit of research. You don't have to have all the answers. When I first started um, started jams, it was this this Tuesday Bible study. It was, the purpose was to an, to answer and 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 give and give an explanation of every single. Um, argument against the faith and there's been times that I had no idea what to answer there's been times that you know uh, I really feel like I got a got a got a handle on the on the problem there's still some things I don't understand and I've started to realize as I get a little, get a little bit older that it's not about having all the answers necessarily as it is <sighs> let's let's go through this together you know what I mean oftentimes people will ask questions not just – people aren't machines. They won't just ask blank questions. Oftentimes they'll be struggling with something or feelings or, or, or a situation that's just hard, and that will give rise to questions. Like, for instance, in the book of Job. Job has all these questions you know, that, that come – he didn't have them before the bad stuff happened. He had them after they happened. Uh, so you know, oftentimes what you can do is you know, give, give, give a listening ear. Um, Answer the questions you can. Offer to look up the ones you can't. Uh, encourage them. You know that kind of stuff. Teach them how to look for answers themselves. Uh, talk with them. You know, not not arguing. Not trying to win arguments. Um, so Proverbs 16. Going back to what I was talking about with the excuse number two. Um, if you look at these different things, uh, I don't I don't need the church. Well, it's it's not about you. Maybe you should look to see how you can help other people in the church. Um, well, I'm strong enough. Oh, pride comes before fall. Just because you aren't struggling with the specific sin that that person is struggling with at this very moment doesn't mean that you won't struggle with that sin. And it also doesn't mean that you aren't struggling with your own sins anyways. So God wanted us to meet. That, that, that was his idea. Uh, the, the church has always met together um, historically. And if you look in the books of the law, for instance, God told the 12 tribes of Israel to camp together around the tabernacle. He didn't say camp wherever you wanted. He said camp together and the point being we are one body and uh, it's very very sad when people of one denomination will kind of just start talking crap about another denomination and you know like we're more saved than them or some nonsense um, going to church ensures that, that the correct uh, you're believing correct teachings um, and, and oh boy oh boy house churches are, are just a, a um, people, most people that I've met who have go to house churches, um, it's not really a place where people grow. It's more a place where people go on rants, and it's not really a biblical based teaching. There's no authority structure, so the leaders are kind of have ulterior motives than than you know. It's just typically it's not great. Um, a church is supposed to be a place where growth happens. Uh, unfortunately, we oftentimes just get in a place of comfort instead. But it should be a place where growth happens, where encouragement is happening. And then it should be a place where better success happens because we're working together. 